Well, here I am riding along with Bill Schultz and his wife, and we're leaving Lockwood Boat Works in South Amboy, New Jersey. And this is Morgan Rail Bridge, which has to be open so we can pass all of the Jersey Coast trains pass over this bridge. And here's the West Jetty of Cheesequake Creek, comprised of old lead kettle bottoms from a company called National Lead. This is now a highly polluted Superfund site. And as we leave the jetty, there's Raritan Bay and Staten Island straight ahead. And here's the historic Great Beds Lighthouse, which no longer operates, to warn boats of the large underwater mountain of oysters. And this is Bill Schultz, the Raritan Riverkeeper who's asking for the Raritan River Railroad Bridge to be open so we can pass. The vessel name is Thunder. And this is something which symbolizes what's been happening to some industries from the past. They've been disappearing, and so has their pollution. At one time, the Raritan River was basically nothing more than an industrial garbage can. If you had an industry that created a liquid waste, you wanted to site your industry along the banks of the Raritan so you had some place to dump your waste. Most of it is not navigable. Um, a lot of it is paddleable. So that's the biggest thing we have going on now is uh, recreational pursuits coming in. And, uh, and really making headway. A lot of people are starting to get back into the river and starting to understand the waterway. Most of the people are concerned with drinkable water and we're more concerned about having healthy waters. to World War I up into the 60s, you had a huge military presence along the Raritan River. Most of the munitions used in the D-Day invasion came through, uh, through Raritan Arsenal. So you had these large ammunition ships and supply ships that came through here. They'd run up the Raritan to the Arsenal, then they had to create a turning basin so the ships could turn around and sail out to sea. And we're gonna see four or five of these landfills, but only one remains active. This one just requires routine maintenance. Along the way, I was happy to see a number of ospreys making their nests. Here's an old coal-fired generating station that even though it has all the equipment to still burn coal, it now burns natural gas instead. Well, now we're coming into Sayerville, which has a boat ramp. But Sayerville is mostly known for having the largest brick-making factory in the country back in the day. Built in 1850, it made bricks for almost 120 years. It was located here because this land was rich with clay. In the middle of this subdivision of houses, the chimney for the factory still stands. Along the bank are thousands, if not millions, of pieces of broken bricks which were once discarded by the factory during its reign. But the Sayer and Fisher Brick Company wanted a faster way to get the raw clay from the clay pit to the factory. So they dug the Washington Canal in 1824 and started churning out bricks faster and better than anyone. So here we are in the Washington Canal, which connects South River.
And here's the town of South River. I like the way folks have found a way to perch over the river, I suppose, to fish or maybe just enjoy the river. And this bridge is remarkable. It's one of the only hand-operated railroad bridges in the country. When a train comes, some guy gets a call, drives over and unlocks the handle used to crank the bridge open or closed by hand. And this boat, it's very strange. It's been sitting on top of the mud back among those reeds for 30 to 40 years. Not sure why, but there it is. Along the way, and during most of our trip on the Washington Canal, we saw lots of this stuff. It's called Phragmites, and it's extremely invasive. This type of reed is usually found in wetlands throughout temperate and tropical regions of the world, and it's also found right here. During most of our trip, Bill was monitoring the osprey nests. He said they're doing very well. And look at these birds. They're right next to the only active landfill along the Raritan River. It's called the Edgeboro Landfill. And people do fish in the Raritan River and catch large and smallmouth bass, sunfish, catfish, trout, chain pickerel, American eels, carp, and yellow perch. Over there, that's the Edison Municipal Boat Ramp. Here's the boat club in Edison, and it's right next to the Donald and Morris Good Kind Bridges, which carry traffic on Route 1, both north and south. Well, now we're getting closer to our final destination, which is New Brunswick. But first, here's Donaldson Park in Highland Park. And on the south side of Raritan River, we're starting to see outcroppings of shale, which extend across the entire state of New Jersey. This channel marker is somewhat old and designates where the authority of the U.S. Coast Guard ends. Look at this house in New Brunswick. A professor at Rutgers used to live here. <laughs> oh, by the way, Route 18 is straight ahead and lies on top of those arches. This is the start of Boyd Park, which is on the waterfront of New Brunswick. Here's the Rutgers Boathouse, and right next to it, the historic Delaware and Raritan Canal, which started here and went all the way to Trenton.
And here's a marina in New Brunswick where any boat can tie up at no charge. You just can't stay overnight. <laughs> and here's where our journey ends at this bridge. Industrial polluters uh, moved into the basin, as I said, you know, the, the river was nothing more than a, an industrial garbage can. They dumped all their liquid waste in the river. And now they've moved on. You no longer see uh, the smokestacks that you had before. Those smokestack industries have left us, taken our jobs and gone elsewhere, but they left all their pollution. So my sort of my pet project here is uh, looking at the legacy pollution that's left by these industries that have abandoned the area. There are things that we can't explain. There are areas that have been cleaned up and we've had pollutant levels rise. Uh, there, there's a site in Edison where uh, after a cleanup, we had higher PCB readings than before the cleanup, which the EPA can't tell me why it happened. Uh, water is becoming a valuable commodity. And, you know, one of our base headwaters is a reservoir. So there's a water company who's got the keys, so to speak, and really um, controls the flow of the river. There's state mandates of uh, minimum flows that have to be maintained. And this is all what man has done to the river system. You know, in the early 1800s, uh, steamboats just filled the waters of the Raritan River as it did the Raritan Bay. And one passenger traveling from New Brunswick wrote about the Raritan River and he, and he said this, quote, the Raritan finds its sinuous way through broad green salt meadows that stretch off like soft carpets until they meet the clay beds and tangled woods of the Jersey shore. It was indeed Holland, the same flat landscape and long stretches of green marsh. One constantly expected a windmill to appear on the sedge or the spires and crooked tiled roofs of a Dutch village. Ironically, the Dutch and English first traveled up the River in 1663 to purchase land from the Native Americans. And with civilization came industries, such as National Lead, which constructed a plant in 1934 and unfortunately leaves a legacy of water pollution and soil contamination, even after it closed in 1982. And by the 1940s, the chemical industry became the dominant employer in Sayreville, surpassing even the brick industry. The Raritan River, I think, is beautiful, and yet I can't help but feel sorry for all the people who may have been negatively impacted by what industry dumped into its waters. And while today we sail and fish and swim in these waters, deep down in the murky sediments of the river, like the Raritan, is something quite toxic and somewhat unnerving. I spoke with Bill a little more about our trip together. We've got, uh, oh, I think it's like 1.2, 1.4 million people that are drinking rare and river water. And my, I concentrate on the lower portion of the river because we want to be careful of what we're drinking. But from where the confluence is of the Raritan and Millstone rivers, from there down, the water's not harvested. It's not sold. So for, it seems like forever, Nobody really cared. So put your industry down there. Dump mm. all your stuff mm. in there. Mm. Dump all your stuff in, in the river because nobody cares. And uh, truth be told, now that we've got it, we're starting to get some interest in the Raritan River. And a lot of it comes to play with Rutgers University starting to, starting to realize they've got a river that runs through their mm. campus and through their backyard. Um, one of the first things we found, when you start talking to science people, you start talking to scientists, you know, it's like, you've got a good argument. You've got something good to say. Mm -hmm. Show me the data. Mm. Well, we'll show you the data up from that confluence up in through the North Branch to South Branch and Black River and all these tributaries that feed in because they're selling that water. That's drinking water. The lower portion, well, there is no data. Mm. So for, for years, what happened was the scientists would turn around and walk away because you can't show them the data, they lose interest. Yeah. We're finally starting to get some people starting to look at it 
and develop the data and say, what's going on down there? Get very interesting. We're starting to get the towns to turn around and realize that the value of a waterway. And, and one of the values is recreational sources. Um, New Brunswick is one of the towns. They've got a, a lovely Boyd Park right on the river. Oh, it's gorgeous, yeah. It's, uh, it's incorporated with the tail end of the Delaware and Raritan Canal. And the entire towpath of the canal, which runs from New Brunswick over to Trenton, um, the whole towpath is a state park. So they've interacted with the state park. Um, they've rebuilt the lower locks of the canal so somebody can go up there and actually see how the canal used to operate. It's, if you haven't been to it, the Delaware and Raritan Canal Locks, this is the end or the beginning as it, as it were. And it really uh, was a canal that ran from New Brunswick to Trenton. And it was responsible for getting goods from Philadelphia to New York, correct? That was the highway at the time. Yeah. It was a short time, but at its height, it carried more gross tonnage than the Erie Canal. My gosh, holy mackerel. Um, you know, again, that was only a few years because then came the railroads and the railroads just, you know, took away that cargo. Um, but it, you know, it, it was the way of getting goods from New York to Philadelphia and the trade in between. And oh, by the way, during the Revolutionary War, Raritan River was a way for troops to go up and down and back and forth, both the British and the colonials, correct? Oh yes, well, the British strongholds were, you know, down in Perth Amway in New Brunswick. And you had all these dirty revolutionary kind of people in the middle <laughs> that didn't like the idea of the British coming over here. So right. It's quite interesting. Right. There's a lot of history to be, you know, if you get into it, there's a lot of history along the Raritan. Yeah. Well, it's, speaking of which, uh, the uh, uh, Sayer and Fisher Brickworks in Sayerville, right, uh, so so named, uh, was the one of the largest uh, brick factories in the country. And it was surprising to me, it, it, it was, I forget when it was established, 18-something, I think, but it lasted well into the middle of the 20th century. It was still making bricks. And uh, there was, uh, we went up, as we saw in the video, we went up the Washington Canal, and the Sayer and Fisher Brickworks dug that canal, especially so they'd have a shortcut to the clay pits to get the clay to bring it back to, to make the bricks. Is that right? Well, the, generally that, that area, Sayreville, South River, um, parts of the Brunswick's, East Brunswick, North Brunswick, out that way. Um, basically, the, the industry there, and there was very little industry in the country at the time, was settled for the uh, sand and clay mining. And the clay mining, of course, led into the brickworks, and uh, the brickworks from our area are are known in many of the structures, even New York City, Washington, D.C., all built with brickworks. And, and he, the, here's a brick with, with the uh, famous S and F initials on it. And if you find one of those, they're probably worth a lot. As we were going up the canal, the banks of the canal were lined with broken bricks, weren't they? From Well, yes. As, uh, you have to realize millions and millions of bricks that were made. Oh, yeah. So nobody wants a chipped brick. So if you chip the corner or if there was a crack in it, well, it's a waste product. Well, what are you going to do with the waste product? Well, the riverbank needed reinforcing. So just take those broken bricks and they use that to reinforce the riverbanks. Mm. So as the ships would move up and down, rather than eroding the, the riverbank and having all that soil wash into the river, this was a way of stabilizing the riverbank at the time. Just throw the broken brick out there. So yes, <laughs> uh, the riverbank in that area, both the canal and the river are lined with broken Sarah and Fisher bricks. And, and we went past, uh, it, it is a sort of the army version of Naval Weapon Station Earl. Uh, it's no longer there, but remnants of it are. What was it? It was the Raritan Arsenal. Tell, tell us about that. Well, it uh, served from, uh, oh, I believe it was just prior to World War One. World War One, World War Two, Korean War, parts of uh, as late as into the Vietnam era. And the munitions were brought there and shipped out. After the, after the conflicts, munitions were brought back and disassembled. Um, some of it was destroyed, some of it was buried. Um, <laughs> it was a very large facility, and at the time, whoever figured that the government would downsize, 
<laughs> oh, the army will always own it. Just take it out in the field and bury it. Yeah. So that's the way things were done at the time. So there, there could be some ordnance buried either in the river or to the side, possibly, maybe. You know. Well, yes. Well, there's a chance now that there may be some something left. Uh, the army has been the Corps of Engineers has been doing a, a pretty commendable job at trying to locate it. They just went through a process where they uh, searched the river, parts of the river adjacent to their dock facility, and um, across into Sarahville, where some of the where they dug out the uh, turning basin for the ships, or where the river had to be dredged. Luckily, they were we were able to, they were able to find the records of where the mud went. So if it was dumped on that island in the middle of the river or on the Sarahville side, um, the army went through there and verified if there was anything and took care of it. Bill, you, we also, on our way out uh, on your boat, uh, and, and I had such a great time, uh, we went past the Great Beds Lighthouse. And the Great Beds Lighthouse, for those of you who don't know, was a lighthouse that uh, was actually erected on top of a great bed of oyster shells because it was a huge oyster area back in the day. And ships kept running into the oyster beds and so they had to put a lighthouse there so that people would know not to go there, to avoid that area. And today it, it was sold, it, it belongs to a private party. But uh, Bill, you're involved in trying to restore, you and the, and the baykeeper, uh, trying to restore oysters, right? How, how's that going? Uh, we're trying. Um, we're getting some decent support from New York. New Jersey's being a little reluctant to support us. Um, but we've been able to get permission to work out at the uh, at a, a portion of the Navy base out at the Naval Weapons Station Earl. And we've got some experiments that we're working on out there trying to bring oysters back. Um, the Corps of Engineers understands the importance of it and indeed after um, Superstorm Sandy the Corps of Engineers has called for hundreds of acres of, uh, of oyster reefs to be created mm. around New York Harbor because they realize that um, the oyster beds on the bottom of the, uh, of the bays could help break up these ocean surges that did so much damage coming in. So we're trying to bring oysters back. You know. do, do we have any sense why they disappeared? Uh, were they, were, did we over oyster or, or what? I mean. Um, did, what happened? Any ideas? Not, probably not so much of over-harvesting. Oysters will settle on eelgrass and grow from there. Um, but the eelgrass beds got choked out with sediments um, as, as the bay bottom, instead of being grass, became mud. So that was it. And pollution levels basically took care of the oysters. And now um, scientists tell us that uh, it seems like the water's would probably be clean enough really? to support the oysters. That's again. great news. And uh, so we're trying to bring them back. So it seems to me that if, uh, that, uh, and I'm guessing here, that with the Great Beds Lighthouse being where it is on the western part of Raritan Bay, that, that oysters maybe favored that area at one time, maybe because there was, before pollution, there was fresh water coming from the Raritan, there was fresh water coming from Arthur Kill, and it was washing through that whole area. And that might have been an ideal place for oysters to exist. But then the water turned against them because there was tremendous pollution from the Raritan, tremendous pollution from the Arthur Kill, and together at the, 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 the bullseye was Great Beds Lighthouse, where that great <laughs> bed of oysters yeah. existed, correct? So that's my theory. Take it for what it's worth. You can bring that to the bank. Oh, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll work on it. So you're pretty passionate sure. about about this. I, I can I, I could sense it when we went out in the boat. You enjoy what you do. You also are looking after the osprey, aren't you? Well, ospreys, ospreys are, are interesting because I like the idea of the birds. Birds can fly any place. There's got to be a reason for them to be in a particular location. If there's something that's working against them or something they're not comfortable with, they just fly away. Mm -hmm. There's a reason that the ospreys are settling in Raritan Basin. And today we've got osprey nests. All the ospreys, I should back up and say that they're on the endangered species list and close to extinction. 
with man's use of DDT years ago. Um, we stopped using DDT, the ospreys start coming back. Why did you decide that you wanted to uh, become the river keeper for the Raritan River? Why, why was that important to you? Oof, you're getting philosophical on me now. <laughs> um, I guess I was just annoyed that some, someone decided that their use of the river was more important than my ability to use the river. Some industry decided it was more important for them to be able to dump garbage, dump their liquid waste into the river and keep me from fishing, crabbing, and drinking the water. And that was annoying. Um, when I was a kid growing up, I, I grew up in Perth Amboy. And at that time, if you went down to the river, you came back and you always got a kerosene soaked rag and you wiped the oil spots off. Mm because it was predominantly oil pollution. And it wasn't until I got to go down on a, on a vacation to Wildwood that it, all of a sudden I came back from the ocean. It was like, there's no oil spots. <laughs> it was a crude awakening. Uh, uh, a crude oil awakening. Yeah, uh, you know, it was a surprise to me. And as I got older, I started realizing that there were people or businesses that had done something to my river and the rivers belong to us you know they don't belong to the state the waterways don't belong to the state or the federal government they're trustees for us they're our waterways yeah. and if there's something going on there that that's wrong or that you're not satisfied with you need to do something well i, I appreciate you uh, being on our program and appreciate you for watching uh, jersey bay shore country don't forget next week We'll have another brand new episode about some aspect of life here at the Jersey Bay Shore. I'm John Schneider, and if you see me on the road or on the river or in the bay, I hope you'll wave and say hello. Thanks, everyone.